I'm Andy Howell, and this is Science vs. Cinema. I'm here in Hollywood at the world premiere of Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets. After centuries of peace and prosperity, an unknown force wants to destroy all we have created. Agents Valerian and Laureline, you have less than 10 hours to find the threat and eliminate it. It's just a full blast. It's a fireworks. Just go sit down and just like, wow, just go. Because it, it, that's a trip. I just got out of Valerian and I have really mixed feelings about the movie. It has unbelievable visuals, amazing settings, incredible aliens, but it's the human characters that aren't that compelling and the plot is pretty subpar. I love the idea of setting something in the 28th century and being so far beyond what we have today that everything seems like magic. I asked the visual effects supervisors how they kept the movie grounded. Well, I mean, there was still quite a lot of uh, live action photography. Action! It was a good mix uh, between the two. And then even scenes like where you're on the Pearl Planet that are based on performance capture, it's still based on actors' performances, and so you get the reality there. So we always try to ground everything that we're doing in some sense of reality and add the fantastic element on top of it. But we try to make sure the science works as much as it can, given what we're trying to create. The physical aspect of the acting incorporated with the visual effects is seamless. <laughs> I asked actor Dane DeHaan about that. I mean, it was amazing, you know? Um, I've never made a movie like this, and uh, it's the movie Luke's wanted to make his whole life, so just to be a part of that was incredible. Could you uh, visualize what you were acting against, uh, or, or, or did you have to use your imagination? Well, I mean, he had pictures and visuals and that kind of thing, and he explained everything, but I used my imagination, but also my imagination only goes so far, you know, and Luke's goes a lot further. So seeing the movie is a whole different thing than imagining it. This movie comes closest to capturing how crazy alien life could be while still keeping it in the framework of some kind of action-adventure sci-fi spectacle. The trick is when you've got like a fully digital world, a fully synthetic world that you have to create. You have to make it convincing and believable so the audience is going to buy into it. So with the planet Mule that we did, which is the Pearl sort of idyllic paradise island, you know, there's a lot of fantastical concepts there, you know. One of the things I liked about Mule as a planet is that it seemed like the atmosphere was a little thinner than ours in that you could see space in the daytime. It's a nice touch that I talked to the visual effects artist about. The stars during the daytime and nebula and stuff out there and the way that the water absorbs, we had to sort of twist the physical parameters a little bit, right. you know, to, to really give the, the vibrant vision of the world. But you're making a story for an audience to believe in, and so they need to have it realistic enough to be invested in it. The more you peel away, you know, the more of the audience, you're going to have disbelieving it and you're going to lose them. Overall, it does take you to somewhere new and different than we haven't seen before. <laughs> Okay, we have seen it before in Contact. All right, science fiction directors, can we stop putting massive giant planets in the atmosphere of another planet? It doesn't make any astrophysical sense. If you had one huge planet in the foreground, maybe you could say the thing that you're on is a moon, but you can't have tons of planets all around you Things have to be in orbit, and if other planets are really nearby, they'll be in different orbits. They won't just stay in your nighttime sky. Welcome to Alpha, the city of a thousand planets. Space Station Alpha is the most amazing concept in the movie. It's built from the International Space Station, and yet it's been added to over hundreds of years. The Alpha Station has grown 7% this year. And since it left the terrestrial orbit, it has traveled almost 700 million miles. Now it's a community where hundreds of species live. You've got not just humans, but some kind of water beings, creatures that are used to some gaseous environment, other creatures who are specialists in information technology. And we get to see all of those in some amazing sequences as we travel throughout the station. There's a really cool submersible scene in the movie Reminiscent of the one in The Phantom Menace. Oh, Goberfish! Except this one is good. 
this technology actually exists today as I found out when the people from Triton Subs took me down in one of their submersibles in the Bahamas. Luc Besson's parents were both diving instructors, so like James Cameron, he's obsessed with undersea creatures. I've seen some pretty astonishing things in the depths. That's as close as we can get to alien life on our planet. So how cool is it to see underwater in outer space? In fact, the space station is better than any of the characters in the movie. To me, all of the fun is in the humans interacting with aliens we've never seen before. No, 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 no. It's to avoid such situations. But all of our information is divided three ways. Kill one of us. And you kill the information. What a pity that would be. Okay, you're gonna have to give me credit though, because I don't have much on me. Oh, how tiresome. When the humans talk to humans, I'm just like, I mean, it's just so boring. Whoa, 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 easy, easy. We're late. Yeah, well, better late than dead. You wanna drive? Whoa, put, put your hand back on the joystick. Each actor is really good on their own, but they don't really come together as a couple. Will you stop complaining about my driving? Yes, I'm sorry, you're a great driver. You're the best driver in the entire universe. Oh, thank you. This isn't quite uh, Leia and Han territory. Looks like you managed to cut off our only escape route. Maybe you'd like it back in your cell, your highness. We're told the characters are in love. You flirt, I smile but we don't really see a whole lot of evidence of this. Agent Valerian, you'll be running solo. I only work with my partner. Hi. We're a team. There's a whole lot of just love slathered on to this science fiction story for no good reason. I am sick of this love is the fifth dimension bull Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. That makes no sense. It's such a stupid trope. There's this trans-dimensional space, and then you can see in that dimension through these goggles. It's a really incredible movie concept, but then a lot of these things are there for the gee whiz factor, and then they're really inconsistently applied, which is kind of annoying. That leads me straight into a wall. You said you wanted the shortest way. On the other hand, there's so much gee whiz in this movie, you can forget about some of these things. It just doesn't even matter very much. I mean, we're talking some serious, crazy 28th century fantasy stuff here. For better or worse, Valerian is aimed towards children. It has a lot of Jar Jar type jokes in it, a lot of visual humor. We need to talk. And the concepts are not very deep. How in space did you get that info? It's not info. Just deduction. We know how humans work. Mm -hmm. They're all so predictable. So for adults, I felt it a little lacking, but kids are gonna love it. It's the shock that I have when I was 16 and I see Star Wars for the first time. I think that's what the film is. It's not conventional, really, but you can't see everything on the one trip. It's impossible. Valerian is trying to be Star Wars to a new generation, but it's a little more like Avatar. This is why we're here. Because this little gray rock sells for 20 million a kilo. Or the original Tron. You believe in the users? Yeah, sure. If I don't have a user, then who wrote me? Spectacular visuals, but weak characters and dialogue. You're running nearly 20 minutes late. Yeah, well, time flies when you're having fun. I love the ambition, though. Astronomical reality is almost always stranger than fiction. So I'm glad to see a movie pushing the boundaries with crazy aliens, exotic settings, and real imagination. That's where Valerian excels. So it's worth seeing on the biggest screen you can. I'm an astrophysics professor, but I'm also a huge film geek. On this show, we take a look at the science in movies. We celebrate when they get it right. It's something that could actually happen. And we school them when they get it wrong. See what happens when we introduce some Martian wind. This is Science versus Cinema. <laughs>